Kiros. Um, so, so nice work did uh, Cerebra's uh, logo redesign, etc. And so he felt obliged to invite me to speak here. Um, it's definitely not on merit. You lie with those searches. Everyone here knows that you lie. I don't write that shit about myself. Um, this is the kind of shit I write, by, write about myself. So these are my the social handles. Um, subtly prompting a little tweet there if you want it. Um, and uh, so firstly, thank you guys for, for all coming out this town to come and listen to me today. Thank you, Ross and the Nice Work team for bringing on Creative Mornings. Um, what I'm going to chat about today is uh, our passion projects. And as you can see, I'm a big fan of passion projects. My, um, my, my life is littered with many, many failed projects. And, um, and it's just because I start them and I'm like, oh man, I'm passionate about this. And then, then I stop being passionate about it and then it dies and it fails and it goes away. But I, but I think I have an addiction to, to kind of starting things and getting things off the ground. Uh, Cerebra is the only thing that I actually kind of uh, have longevity with and I think it's because they pay me money and so I'm, I'm obliged to, to, to rock up every day and, and do my job. But, um, but passion projects are a big thing for me personally and, and it, it bleeds into, into what we do at Cerebra. If you, if you, if you arrive for an interview at Cerebra, at some point I'm going to ask you about your passion projects. Like, Outside of work and doing a job and fulfilling on a roles or responsibility sheet that your HR manager gives you, what do you do that's, that, that you're passionate about? Like, what do you create? What value do you add to the world? And what I'm trying to do is separate people who, who spend time consuming versus people who spend time producing. And, um, and I want to find people who produce. I want to find people who contribute to the world as opposed to take from it. You know, we grew up in a, in a rich media rich media lifestyle where you know it's TV, radio, all this kind of stuff. And I'm not completely anti-TV, but you're just a consumer. You're you, you know you're, you're not actually participating. You're not contributing to anything. So I try to look for people who who have these massive passion projects outside of the office. Um, and another reason why they're really valuable for me and to, to have employees with passion projects is because I know that it's a source of inspiration for them outside of their job. Right? If your job is all that you've got, and most jobs are 90% tough and 90% like begrudging, um, often that 10% isn't enough. Often people need a, like a mistress. They need a little thing that they get to cheat on their, on their job with that gets them really excited. And they want to leave the office to go and do something else. And, that's, and for me, that's really cool. But um, so, so two days ago, I was, um, I was checking Twitter and I saw this cool story. And, and this is going to set the ultimate bar uh, against what, against which all side passion projects uh, will be measured as complete failures compared to this guy. Um, this is Matteo Flamini, who was a midfielder for Arsenal for a couple of years. Um, he was very successful there, and he got transferred to Milan. And he wasn't successful in Milan, so they benched him. And so he spent two seasons on the bench. And um, but he decided that listen, he's getting paid pretty well as a as a European league footballer. And he's, he had a passion for the environment and for and biology and that stuff. So he got together with one of his mates and he said, listen, like, I've been, when I'm on the bench, like, it's, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to run down my career. I want to start doing something on the side that I'm passionate about. And so he's, um, he's passionate about, uh, about saving the environment. And so him and his mate started investing money and started doing research into synthetic replacements for fossil fuels. And, um, and they, they, um, they went public three or four days ago with their business that has now has the patent and they solved it. They've created a synthetic replacement for petrol. And so now we can we can mass produce petrol synthetically. Um, and the company's now was pretty much immediately valued at a billion dollars. And um, and it was his passion project. He spent many, many years, him and his mate just doing research, meeting people, flying around the world. And and his whole thing was like in, well like what if we get this wrong? Like, I've got a passion for it. I'm driven to do it, and um, and it, the moment the moment they figured out to tip, it now it's obviously going to become a, a business. So it ceases to be a passion project. But but that's kind of the bar, right? I think that's about as about as successful as we can hope to be. Um, the rest of the stuff is pretty pretty average compared to that. But I want to I want to introduce you guys to a couple of passion projects from guys who work at Cerebra because as I said, it's a big part of big part of me and big part of driving it. So I love to encourage guys to get going. So we've got a couple of guys who do Young Things podcast. We've got a podcast studio in the office, so they tend to start quite quickly. So um, Anthony and Jacques do Young Things podcast. Uh, Janine and Sebo do a Frank podcast, where they discuss, very frankly, uh, a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, a couple of girls, uh, Danny and Nicole, do the, the Kitchen Thief 
um, uh, Instagram account, and one of them is a vegan, and the other one is sometimes a vegan. And, um, <laughs> and what they do is they, they, they publish incredibly cool um, pictures of, uh, with recipes and so on and so forth of vegetarian and vegan foods, etc. And the account's growing, getting a lot of a lot of attention. And then Tanya does uh, polygon art, which uh, is not as big as I would hoped it to be, but but it's absolutely incredible polygon art stuff that she does. And she started as a fashion project, and she's already picked up a couple of commission gigs and is, is making a bit of money on the side. Um, and so that's all really cool. My passion project, uh, for a lot of you that know me already, my passion project is the Ad South Africa Instagram account. Um, I, I'm less passionate about Instagram and more kind of obsessed with Instagram. Like I really, I really have a bit of an addiction to the, to the platform. And, um, and in, in the, the realm of love, I think it's kind of like wife, child, Instagram, and then everything else is like somewhere down there. Like, I really do love Instagram. I love the community, I love the people, I love taking photos, consuming photos. Every morning I get to fly around the world in my phone and just see amazing stuff. And a few years ago, um, I realized that I actually wanted to, I, I, I realized that uh, Instagram is a really cool platform for telling, telling stories. And I felt like no one was doing a good job of telling South African stories. So, uh, so I was like, I want to start a, like a passion project uh, to help profile South Africa on Instagram. And so I did what I assumed most people would do as the first step in this in this process is to go and see who runs at South Africa. Like that's the first thing you do. So I went to the South Africa account, and this is what I saw. Um, that was the that was the most recent picture up on the account. That's uh, the the lady is Elizabeth Green. Um, and that's her boyfriend or whatever it is. Now Elizabeth Green is a young American lady who registered at South Africa uh, in October 2010 when Instagram launched. And she was in Cape Town on holiday and she saw, oh, this new social platform's launched. So she jumped on the domain, very smart of her, on the username, very smart of her. She got the account and she had, I think, six photos of her nail polish and then this one. This was by far the best photo on the account. Um, so, so I did a really bad job of doing a screenshot, but you can see, I just kind of said, Hi, I want to run a campaign profiling something, blah, 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 blah. Um, and can we have a chat about this username? And um, and I didn't hear anything back for months. I, just, I made the comment, and it was about three months later, I woke up one morning, checked Instagram as you do, and there was a comment from Ad South Africa. And I was like, oh, here we go. And and she just said, what's your email address? And I was like, oh, this is all oh, now. Okay, so I was like, screw the spam bots, I don't care. I just wrote a credit to Rupert the other day. Hit send. And then for the rest of the morning, like I was in the shower, I was like, oh, this is, and I was quite distraught by it. I was like, well, how's this going to play out now? You know, I really want, I really want this new thing. Um, I just don't know how much I want it. And so I got on my scooter and I was riding to work and I was thinking, like, what is it worth? I mean, what would I, what would I pay for it? Because I think I had like 12 followers or something um, and, and six really bad photos. So I was like, oh, would I, you know, would, would I pay, would I, I'd pay a thousand rand for it. Like, that's what it is. I mean, everyone would pay a thousand. Would you pay 10,000 rand for it? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so the whole way, I was like, I don't know, I don't know what it's worth, and what, you know, etc. And I got to the office, I opened my email, and there was an email from Elizabeth Green. Something like that, South Africa. And I opened it, and she went, "Okay, so here's the password." Um, she goes, "I've changed the owner of the account over to your email address. I've deleted all my photos." Um, and she goes, and, and she said, like, uh, and, uh, she's like, I, "I'm glad someone wants to do something with the account." because I've been doing nothing with it, and it's really irritating because people just tag you in random stuff. <laughs> and so she, and she literally said, I'm glad someone wants to do something with this, um, and so uh, make me proud. And she ended up with make me proud, and I was like, oh, damn it, like, you the emotional hooks. <laughs> so I was like, I will flip this, like, I will pay a thousand rand instead of ten, and we'll move on to speak to proud. Change your business prior right there. And I was actually saying, make me proud. No, no, I can't say that. So, so that's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to make Elizabeth Green proud for, for the last two and a half years. And, um, and the account is, 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 is really average, right? And, I, and I, I'm not saying that to try to be humble or anything, but it really is average because I don't post my own photos. I steal photos and I post them online. And then, as a thank you, I give credit to the photographer um, for helping me grow an account without actually doing anything. Um, but the whole purpose of the account is to tell incredible stories, and um, and that's literally what I do. I just I the only work that I put in is trawling the hashtag to try and find stories that I think are, are worth sharing with the world. Right? Um, the the guy on the left is a is a kid who lives by the lives by the hole in the wall in the Eastern Cape, and every day he has to walk a couple of k's, and then he has to swim across the river mouth to get to the hole in the wall, the hole in the wall where he acts as an informal tour guide, and that's how he 
how he makes money for his family. It's a, it's a guy, Chris, took that photo. Uh, Matumba is a, a baby, baby rhino that was rescued from a poke chair. And um, so we often feature her. Um, and then, um, and then the, the pavement bookworm, this guy went around the world. It was crazy from, from this photo. Um, he sat on Empire Road, just down the road here, and did book reviews. People would donate books, you'd read them, and they'd do reviews to people in traffic, and if they liked the review, they'd buy the book. Mm -hmm. right? and that, that's how he made a living, and he has since written a book, which is quite cool. Um, and more stories and more stories. So you've got the Rhino relocations, you've got Joseph, who's a herdsman, and then you've got the, the, the story, like people love that. Like it was, a, it was a baby zebra that got stuck in mud, and then the Rhino went in and dug it out with its horn, which is really cool until you realize that it killed the zebra with a horn. And um, that's quite sad. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to put it down a little bit my head. Um, but I'm sure something would have eaten the zebra and then we carry on, right? So it's fine. Um, so what I did is, so, so anyway, so I started the account in May, in May 2013 and I just started posting pictures and my rule was I'll post one picture a day and I'll try to do it for a year. And so I started, so that was it. The first 365 days was 365 photos. Um, I also asked every person for permission for that entire time, um, can I post your photo? And the 365 people said yes, so I just stopped asking. I was like, I'll take it as an assumption, and if someone complains, then I'll take it out. Um, and then I started, like, it, it, I started to get into the routine of it, and it was cool, and then I felt like I needed to challenge, do a bit of a challenge, because I think all passion projects, at a certain point, you're like, I need to, I need to push, push a bit. So I thought, started thinking of campaigns. So in, I think it was May, May last year, May 2014, um, I did the. Uh, I started, did a campaign around our, our national elections, and it was the day before. And I went, oh, wait, we should do something. So I designed like a little infogram, uh, just saying if you want to tell your, um, if you want to tell your voting story, just post it on Instagram, tag at South Africa, use this hashtag, and you could get featured. Um, and then I asked a whole lot of my mates on Instagram to repost it, publish it, and we had six thousand photos tagged in the first in the twelve hours of voting which was, I was blown away, right? which was really cool, it went mad. I was playing golf, um, I went to vote and went to go play golf and everyone hated me because I was on my phone all the time. But it was a cool campaign and it made me realize that this little account, in the first year I think I only had like 10,000 followers. The little account has got a lot of reach, like a lot of people will engage with this stuff. Um, so then last year again, I did, I did the a Heritage Day campaign because everyone was having this really big fight online about the difference between Heritage Day and Friday. And, um, and it's a, it was an emotional fight, and I, I don't like the concept of Bride Day, I like the concept of Heritage Day because there's a lot more to it. And so, in, in, in kind of as an act of defiance, I spent all of Heritage Day posting photos from all of our national heritage sites across the country to go, this is our heritage. So I did that, and that got a lot of engagement, a lot of people were really cool. And then the most recent one, which was my big, like culmination of my big passion project, was to put together the National Insta Meet. And, um, and I really wanted to see like can this can this digital thing become a real world thing, and and, and it turns out that it could. So so South African tourism uh, after after me irritating them as much as I could agreed to pay for it because I, I didn't want to pay for it myself. Um, so so they agreed to give me some money to, to make this happen. So we put up a quick very quick website and we announced it. And I was like, guys, if anyone's keen to go to Crofronet for four days, go hang out and take photos and do whatever else you do in Crofronet. Um, like just put your name down, like go and register on the site and let, let, let's have a look, right? And then and we had 450 odd people register on the site. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. I thought we'd have 50 people go to Crofronet. So we had 450 people and then 236 people showed up in Crofronet, which I couldn't believe. I mean, it's a long drive. Uh, people drove in from all across the country, they went to Crofronet and we had four days of hanging out to this cool little town in the Karoo, taking photos connecting with people and, and finding amazing stories. And it was it was one of the like most emotional kind of four days I've ever had because it literally was this thing that I was so unbelievably passionate about. All these people that I'd met through this platform and in this digital realm were suddenly arriving in this town because I put up a little infogram saying, who wants to go to Profinet? And I just I couldn't believe that so many people would respond to it. I couldn't believe how many people shared this passion that I had. Um, and it was really cool. So um, I'm gonna, I'll show you guys a video that um, that we put together. Uh, uh, my friend Gareth Pond did it. I don't understand anything in the script because I don't know if he was on drugs or something. But um, but this is a quick video to show you guys what happened. Uh, what happened in roughly it. We all 
all begins somewhere. Starting from afar. Close. From within. Some ease in and others charge blind. But as our journeys begin, our paths become shared. And as we meet, we'll see what we see and beauty will find us in the most unexpected places. Moments will be made as the finer details become the subject of our memories. We find momentum, a movement of hearts, as the change in our minds slowly but surely become the reality we've desired. Differences become clear and our colors beautiful. And we realize that diversity is our biggest strength. We began in different places and those who were once strangers now stand beside us. We awaken to find we are creating alive together. Because then it's not worth it, right? Like it, you mustn't. It, it, the project is a slave to you, not the other way around. Um, I'll quickly jump through some of the some of the numbers because I'm, I'm quite nerdy about the numbers and I'm quite proud of it. So these are some of the numbers of the of the account. So I've been running it for 900 days. So every single morning before 7 a.m. without fail, having missed a day, I posted someone else's photo to the account. Um, over the over the 900 days, I posted 1,300 photos. Sometimes we do multiple photos a day. There's uh, been 55,000 comments, uh, 90,000 followers now, 138,000 photos that have been tagged, which is quite cool, and there's been 2.9 million likes on the account in the 900 days, which is which is a lot of likes. It's a lot of people <laughs> liking photos of South Africa, um, and and the only reason why I'm proud of these numbers is because it's a massive blow. I mean, it's 60% of the audience is international, so only 40% South African. That's a lot of people liking our country. So a lot of people liking these photos and using the photos to build itineraries. You see in the comments, you see people tagging the same people in a string of photos saying, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And they follow the account before they come out here and they start going, oh my God, you can see people, I'm going to be there in three weeks, I'm going to be there in two weeks. And then after their holiday, they unfollow and that's cool. Like it served its purpose, it did what it needed to do, right? Um, and and I, just, I can't believe it. Like it, was, it is such a, an insignificant amount of work. It really is, it's not a lot of work. And I think it's had a really big impact. Well, for me, it has. Um, and so I love that. It was, it's, it's a really cool thing that's contributed to, to South Africa's perception overseas. But it's tiny. It really is small. And I want to give you a perception of where I, where I think it can go. It's because it's got 90,000 followers, 40% of which are, um, are South African. So let's just call it roughly 40,000 um, South Africans follow the account. There's 1.8 million South Africans on Instagram. So that's crap. 
right? Like, that's no way. Like, you know, got like a fraction of a percent of South Africa's Instagram community follow the account. So we've got a long way to go. Um, I want to chat about, about passion projects in general now, enough about the South Africa stuff. And because um, because I think one of the big things I want to encourage you guys to start passion projects or to recommit to ones that you started before that have fallen off the table or whatever it is, um, because I think that everyone has the capacity to do a passion project and we should all be doing it because it's really really healthy for us. Um, in order to do that, we have to tackle some of the myths. Um, the first myth for me is that it's like someday we'll retire. I think a lot of people believe we're going to retire. Spilly on his uh, little name badge says I'm working towards retirement. Um, he will never retire, he lies. Um, we, it, it, uh, the world isn't like that anymore, right? We have such unbelievable access to tools to create, to produce, to be able to affect the world around us. Is that me? Ah, oh, cool. <laughs> Don't worry about it, I wasn't in a rhythm or anything. Um, the, um, I, I, I don't think we're going to retire the same way that we did before. I think if we look at our parents who got a gold watch and left and then died, um, like that's how it goes, right? Because the moment you disconnect and you go live in George and you just degrade, right? you're like, what the hell is going on? Um, I think most of us recognize that, that we may stop being employed at a certain point in time, um, but we probably won't stop working. We're probably going to keep working until we really, really can't work anymore. Um, and so the definition of retirement has changed, and I think it's our passion projects, it's the things that we can truly, truly connect to at an emotional level that will keep us going, that will keep us alive. And if they're just passion projects, if they don't become money, then at least we're not bored and doing gardening, right? At least gardening is your best product. Um, but potentially they can become incredibly valuable and can actually be a source of income through time, which is pretty cool. The next myth is that you've got to quit your job. Um, I, yes, man, you can't go to Facebook these days without reading an article about you have to quit your job to follow your passion. And, and like, unless your passion is traveling around the world, like Chanel, who was my previous creative director, she heard she had a passion for traveling. I was like, no, you're going to have to travel then. Um, like, she quit her job, that's fine. Most other people, the worst thing you can do is quit your job, right? Because it, 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 dis it disconnects you from a source of income, which is catastrophic for most people. Okay. But you also don't need to commit fully to a passion project, right? It is literally marrying your mistress, okay? Um, be careful that the, the moment you think, I have to quit my job to be able to follow this, you're probably, it's probably looking at another job as opposed to a passion project. So be wary of that one. The biggest one for me is this permission thing. There's a myth that so many people sit around subconsciously waiting for permission to do something. You don't need permission to do it. Right? Uh, a lot of the time you just ask, hey, can I have this username? And they're like, yeah, sure. And even with me, for a while I thought, someone is going to take this away. Like someone from the South African government is going to walk in and go, we own this username. Just take it, right? <laughs> um, I, 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 I genuinely did feel like, like I needed someone's permission to start running this account. And it was nerve wracking to start posting photos. And when for only the first week or two, when a photo got too many likes, I'll be like, oh, more so people are going to see this, right? Uh, there's this weird thing in our head that we need permission to do stuff, and we genuinely don't. The rules are set by other people, and those rules are designed to prevent you from getting as wealthy as they are, right? Um, just go out and start doing stuff. If, at a certain point, you do need permission, then deal with that there, but you definitely don't need permission to start with stuff. Um, this, this do what you love thing. Is, is a common, and I believe it's a misperception, it's a common thing. A lot of people go, oh, you've got to do what you love, right? If you, if, you're not, if you don't enjoy your job, go off and do what you love. And, excuse my language, it's bullshit. Right? It really, really is. Okay? Do what you're really good at. Right? We live in a world that requires us to be wealthy. We've got to have finances, we've got to pay for stuff. We need an income. Um, unless you truly are planning on being a bum on a beach somewhere, you're going to need income. And if you need income, the best way to get income is to do what you're really good at. It'll be the fastest or the, the best financial return on the least amount of time. And that's what we want, because then that frees up time for other stuff. But the fastest way to stop being passionate about something, and the fastest way to start hating something, is to have to make money doing it, right? Because making the act of selling something, the act of making money, is selling a part of our soul, especially when it's a passion project, right? We have to sell a part of this. We have to cede rights to someone else to tell us what to do and how to do it and when to do it by. Right? I firmly believe you do what you're good at making, or what you're good at to make, get the 
most amount of financial return in the shortest period of time. Passion projects, you want to avoid that. Okay. Um, and then the final one, as much as I showed you guys the numbers around the South Africa account, uh, this is a, a friend of mine, Fence, who's Uncle Scrooge on Twitter. And um, the, the, the instant meet, the whole thing, was, it was a massive project and, and I spent a lot of other people's money getting it done and it was really cool. But the entire thing for me personally came down to a single moment. It was on the Saturday night, we just had a big party and a big meal and it was really cool. And it was the last night and everyone was like just having the best time in the small town hall in Crawford And I was sitting outside the town hall on, the, on, the, on one of the ledges smoking a hubby, like just winding down, going, oh, this was, it was a good four days. And this old Afro Khan's guy, like when I was like, like 60 years old, he, when he registered on the first day, I was like, this guy's in the wrong queue. <laughs> like literally he was queuing and I was watching him going, like he thinks we're giving out free stuff. Like, when he got to the front of the queue, Lucy was like, hi, what's your, what's your username? And he gave her the username and we were like, wow. So he lived in Crawford he was one of the people from Crawford who'd registered to attend an event in their town. A 60 year old Afrikaans guy, always dressed really smart, even on the insta walks around his own town. So, anyway, so he, he was there on the Saturday night. And I was sitting outside, and, and, um, and a fancy was sitting around, and sitting, chatting, smoking, hoping. Fancy's a big dude, he's a big black dude. And he was wearing a hat that said Black Ego on it, uh, which makes him even more intimidating. So, this Afrikaans guy, like, like waiting, standing around patiently, standing patiently, and eventually, like, Fancy, I come and notice him there, and he goes, excuse me, uh, accent, I'm sorry, he goes, excuse me, he goes, are you uh, Uncle Scrooge? <laughs> and Fancy's like, yeah, and this guy goes, I am your biggest fan. <laughs> and Scrooge, being who he is, is like, oh man, he gives him the biggest hug, and these two dudes are hugging each other, and then for like 30 minutes, they just sat, sat there, stood there talking about photography and Instagram, and like, Scrooge is like, oh dude, I've got to follow you, and the guy's like, almost, and then like chatting and, 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 yes, and, I, and I just sat and I went, you know what, like if all of it came down to that moment, like I got my satisfaction. Like that was my moment. And and in the in the weeks after the event, chatting to different people, everyone had their own moment. Like that was my moment. It was no one else's. And it was cool. And it didn't matter how many people showed up. It was just these cool moments that where people connected. And that for me is what it was about. It wasn't like, did we make money out of this? Or, or you know, X many people showed up, whatever. For me, the, all the success came down to that one moment. And, um, and that's what a passion project is about, right? It's about passion, it's not about anything else. So, so as I said, I encourage you guys to start your passion projects. There's only one reason not to, because we are all capable. We have all the tools online, production tools, everything. Like the, the cost of production has dropped to zero. We can all publish and share freely online. So there's only one reason not to, and it's that you don't want to. Okay? And if you don't want to, that's totally okay. Like, I'm, I won't force anyone. If you literally don't want to do a project, you want to sit and watch 16 seasons of Lost in a row, please do that by all means. Okay, like if, that, if your passion is like couch potatoing, then go for it, right? Um, if you do want to though, if you do want to start a passion project, then I'll, I want to give you guys my advice, right? So the best piece of advice I can give you is define a one-person audience, and that, that, that one-person audience is you. You're the only person that you have that you have to make happy with this project. Not a single other person, right? If if you start trying to please other people, you're going to be split all over the place. You're it's an audience of my my thing in South Africa is an audience of one. People go, how do you decide which photos to post? If I like it, I post it, right? It really is that simple. I don't care if other people like it or if they don't if they don't like it. It's my account. I'll just post photos that I like. It's quite coincidentally, photos that I like, other people also like which is quite cool. But if I was sitting there going, I need to find a photo that 90,000 people are gonna like, like how these, they aren't photos that good, right? They aren't, you, it becomes overwhelming. So you just do stuff for you and define yourself as that audience of one and do it purely to make yourself happy. Um, this is another one and it's not just because I have a full-time job that I say this, but you have to lust for scarcity, right? We, we, most of us have jobs here, I assume, and we all know that what a job is, is doing as little as possible in as long a time as possible to get through the day. Like, that is the definition of a job, right? Um, that is not what passion projects are about. When you create scarcity, you create scarcity in time, you create scarcity in resources within your passion projects, it forces you to focus, it forces you to decide what's most important, what is the most value back to me as a human being, and I'll do that and I'll do only that, right? Our jobs are like, oh, Four. 
a lot of different hours of other stuff to do, right? Um, and we try and stretch it out. My job isn't that great, right? But, um, but we have to last for scarcity in your passion project. It forces you to make really, really good but difficult decisions. All right, I will do this and I will not do that. Um, avoid the money sadness, right? Money is sadness in passion projects, and I'll tell you why. Because money connects you to someone who is going to tell you what they think you should do. And that's bullshit. Like, that is, that is the death of all creativity right there. Okay? The moment you try and create money out of something, you're selling it so you're, you're selling the rights to be able to define what this thing is. Um, and, and it's the mistake that a lot of people make early on, is as soon as their passion project starts getting, starts getting attracting any kind of interest, they start going, oh cool, like, we'll, like maybe I can sell some prints, or maybe I can do this, right? Not, not all money de destroys all passion projects, but if you want it to be a true passion project, it has to be for you and about you, and only you, and not anyone else. And the moment money comes into the equation, you're introducing other people who are gonna have a right over it. Also, um, and speaking as a, a, a wealthy white privileged guy, um, the longer you can hold out, oh, must I lie to you? Um, the longer you can hold out before introducing money into the conversation, the more money you'll make in the end, right? If someone had walked up to me in the early days of South Africa and said, I'll give you 10,000 Rand for this account, if I needed 10,000 Rand and I was in it for the money, I would have sold it. If someone walks up to me and says, I'll give you a million Rand for the account, <laughs> but I probably wouldn't. Um, and the reason being is because I still think in three years' time it'll be worth ten times that, right? If, if I did. And if it isn't, it doesn't matter because what I get out of it is not money. What I get out of it is passion and, and a sense of being and a sense of fulfillment and, and a reason to kind of do something cool. Like money comes from my job and that's fine. So it links back to earlier about, about quitting your job. You've also got to push your skills. Uh, you know, we all, as, as creative human beings, we get bored quite quickly. Um, and the same thing happens in passion projects. The South Africa account, while the formula remains the same, I keep trying to do bigger things and, and get a bit braver each time um, because it's that bravery side of things that, that forces me to, to push what I believe is possible and it's that that keeps it interesting. I think if it was still just a photo a day, I would probably have hired someone else to do it. Um, and then my final thought, um, which, is, which is the best form of encouragement, and Ross kind of screwed me by digging up all my past history online and all world bios. But, um, but I've got a big belief system around, around approaching these things and, it's, and it, it revolves around this concept of failing a forest. And so the saying goes that the tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it and make a sound. Um, so if you fail online and no one, if, if, like failure online is defined by no one sees it. But if no one sees it, then is it a failure? Like there's no risk around embarrassment online. Okay, success is that everyone sees it. That is what success is in an online world. So, so if you start a project and it fails because no one saw it, then just do something else. Like that's not really a failure, it just was a moment in time and you get to carry on and do something else. But I think a lot of us are, are trapped with this thing of, if I do it, what if it's crap? And you go, well, if it's crap, no one will care. And if no one cares, then it, that doesn't impact you at all. Right? So, um, so, so with that, I genuinely do encourage you guys to start your passion projects, connect with old ones. Um, do anything, stop watching TV and start producing somebody else. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much, guys. Do you have a question? Did you fail at finding your dominatrix? I did. I did. Um, she became my wife. Um, so I succeeded in that respect. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Not about my wife. <laughs> Again. Does no one have any questions? No one has any questions. Uh, What's your was favorite? Was it that shit? <laughs> anyway. Too comprehensive. Sorry, no. What's, what's your favorite other person's passion project that you've bumped into recently? Uh, wow. Everything by Elon Musk. No, so, so I, and, and it's not just because he's a mate, and it's not just because he's an audience, but I, like Spilly for me is someone that I always connect with, um, and, I, and I get to call Spilly, and also Nick Harry in Cape Town with Nick Sox, right? Um, but, but Spilly had a passion for business and a passion for coaching. He was stuck in a job that paid him really well that he hated. <laughs> um, he was, he had this like trick because he was forced out of the job, forced into 
making something of his passion project. But he's now infinitely more successful than he ever was before, even though he probably doesn't make as much money. He's, he's 10 years younger than he was. He's happier, he's married, he's living, the, he's living his dream more than anything. And it's because he decided to put passion ahead of money. Sorry, I forgot to you. Yes. Lizzie? Yeah. Um, yeah, we chat every now and again. Every now and again I get an email from her going, like, hey, it's looking cool and that kind of stuff. If I um, if I'd raised enough money, I had a, I had an email that's still actually in my drafts folder, but I never sent it, but um, if I'd gotten up enough money out of SA Tourism, I would have flown her out here for the Insta meet and her off it. But um, we, but um, I wasn't I wasn't that good at negotiating. <laughs> but um, but she screwed me right royal. Like I literally probably could never sell the account. Like I, I still have to do it right. I have that emotional. <laughs> I have to give her a share or something. I have to negotiate like what it's worth. <laughs> Um, as many as you have time for. I think you would naturally categorize them. You know, I think I think some things you're gonna do just because maybe you wanna learn something. So if you go to a cooking course or something like that, like it's, it's still it's fine, right? Um, but I, but I, I think I think you should you should have enough that you can focus on them without destroying your source of income and without destroying your life outside of that outside of that, you know. Um, one passion project is fine, but I think as humans we tend to be more passionate about many things. Um, they don't have to be disparate either. You can have them, they can be interlinked. Mm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I was the Instagram account. Which photo has received the most amount of time? Yo, let's keep Um, <laughs> <laughs> So Brent, God. You like, would you guys be on stage? Um, so, so Brent, Brent WhatsApp me a photo and said, you better feature my photo. Because <laughs> he was on a helicopter over Cape Town. And so he's got a photo of the, the Cape Town Stadium with a mountain in the background. It was an average photo. But people, people really liked it. Um, but, but just, just to take away from Spilly, like the, the account grow, is growing so quickly now that, that the, the most liked photo will always be in the most recent 20 or 30 photos. So, so he'll be he'll be asked it. He'll be asked it pretty soon. Um, the, the, the embarrassing thing is the photo with the most comments. There's a photo there with over 700 comments. Wasn't even taken in South Africa. It was taken in the Maasai Mara during the Great Migration. It was this huge croc eating, swallowing a zebra head, um, and people lost their minds over that. Like, like non-South African to non-South Africans, that's really offensive apparently that crocodiles are allowed to eat other animals. I couldn't believe it. Like and some lady actually commented and went, you just put me off my lunch. Like, I can't even begin to explain the irony of this. Like, are, you having, are you having a steak? I'm assuming. A job. Like, they, like you know, there's, there's now I think there's like I think the, there's five photos over six thousand likes um, uh, on each photo. But yeah, I think you know, with the account, it, it's mad. It's growing at like two, three hundred followers a day now, just organic. So it, it, like I just still just post that photo in the morning, and it kind of does its own thing. So I don't know I don't know where it's going to go. But next, I'm a bit bored at the moment. So next year I've got plans to do so to to try and do do something slightly different because I think you can only do so many photos on Table Mountain before I'm going to put it back to my head. Um, so, um, but also, like, there's, there's a trap around the account because um, I'm not qualified to tell a lot of stories. I'm qualified to tell Table Mountain stories and photos of beaches, but there's so much more to South Africa. There's so many richer stories and deeper stories that I, I, that I believe have to be told. Um, I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not qualified to make those decisions. So. Um, I think as the account grows, it needs to actually, I need to get other people involved who, who can tell those stories. Yes? Um, what is South African tourism? What is their attitude the account? They, so, so, like, they, they love and hate it. So it is very much a love hate. They love the fact that I'm doing their job and they don't have to pay me. Um, and which is a good thing, right? I'm literally, I, it, it, I'm doing a better job than they can do with a, a team of paid people. And, 
but it's not, that's not because of me, it's just because of the use of it. Like it literally is all down to the fact that it's at South Africa. Um, but so they, they, they hate the fact that it's not their property. But they've worked with me. I've worked with them on projects that insta meet, as I said. Like at the end of the day, they hit all their metrics around exposing a, a small town in South Africa to a massive audience. I mean, there was like, like it was a reach of over 10 million from that, from that one event, which is, which is pretty big. Um, so they, they love, they absolutely love that, but I think they would like, like it if it was theirs. And I think they're embarrassed that they never asked Lizzie for the use of it. <laughs> yes. So, starting a passion project is kind of like starting a diet. You say, I'll get around to it on Monday, I'll get around to it on Monday. How do you discipline yourself to kick it off and make sure you maintain it? I think, I think if it requires too much discipline, then, then you're probably not that passionate about it. It's, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't equate it to a diet, I think. Um, I would equate it to running more. You know, I think it, it's the same thing. Like, if you, if you want to lose weight, start running, because you're much more likely to fall in love with running than you are to fall in love with eating salad. Um, <laughs> so, but I think, I, 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 again, like, like diet intensity, I know it's a bit of a, a, a negative thing, right? Um, but again, like, I would flip it into a passion thing. So, so, so I, you know, I would go, cool, my, I'm going to do a project now that's going to explore every single possible food that is available on the planet that fits within this, this eating regime that I'm going to undertake. So you're not, you're not uh, starving yourself of things that you love, you're actually introducing yourself to things that you've never tasted before, but that potentially fulfill on the same desired objective, which is weight loss. Um, but uh, yeah, like, the diet is painful. Like you feel like you have to, you feel like you're starving yourself of something. And a passion project shouldn't be. Passion project, you should get to the end of the day and really, really want to leave work. And it, and it, it sounds contradictory, but if there are guys that work at Cerebra that at five o'clock aren't desperate to leave, to go do something else, then there's something wrong. Like, if you sit in the office just wasting your time, then you're wasting your time, you're wasting your life. Like, I'd rather have someone who comes in, who does a really good job, is, is, delivers value to the business, and then goes, and goes and does something else that rejuvenates them, and reconnects them to cool stuff. Because what they learn in their passion projects, they bring back into the business every single time without fail. Sorry? Um, what are the risks of telling your passion project to a permanent job? Um, it is you, you set out. It, 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 like, it, and it, it's not that there aren't examples. You know, I mean, there's guys that, that, have, that have done really well, but there, there, are way, there, there are way fewer examples of people who've succeeded financially following a passion project than there are people who, who failed. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I think that, I think that the moment, the moment you the moment you turn it into a job, you, you ruin all of the good, the things that make it good. Um, you know, you have to compromise what you do to make money. You you have to fill up an entire day doing this thing. You have to find people who are willing to buy whatever it is that you're doing, and you have to change what it is you want to do to suit them. Now suddenly, it's a job. Now, so, I mean, most of you guys are creative people, right? Like the worst people on the planet are clients, right? Like it really is, okay? And the reason is, and, and, and it's not that they're bad people, but they've got their mandate, and their mandate is directed by their boss, who often sits overseas, and it's this email chain, and now you've got a person, and, and they come to you and go, we're gonna pay you money to do this, and you go, fantastic, here's how I think we should do it, and they go, nah, like I think we need to have a say in this, because I'm paying you money. And the moment that person has a say in it, like you've got a comp, you've got a potentially comp, not all the time, but you've got a potentially compromised uh, product. You're working on something that someone else is going, oh, I don't like this, I think you should change this, I think you should change this. And then you go home and you're like, oh, that was a rough day. When you're the only person that you answer to, then you, you almost have no rough days, or you rough on yourself, which is, which is actually good. Okay, last question, make it a good one. Um, what would you say to a student who's going into an intern and trying to make a living for himself, but still wants to do these passion projects, but you want to give it your all and make a name for yourself in the industry? Um, use everything online. 
if, if, as I said, as a hotel, because obviously the ambition is to end up getting a good job, right? Having done tons of interviews, the, the, the easiest question to ask someone in an interview is to say, what do you do? The hardest question is to say, what have you done? Okay? And with interns, the question, what have you done? You go, I've studied, right? And they say, I need someone with experience. And then we start this circle, right? Except if you turn around and you go, well, this is what I've done. Like, I built this thing, and or I, I, I contributed to this, or I started this movement, or this event, or I create this in the background. What you're doing is you're demonstrating an ability to create and add value. And as an employer, that's for the companies that you really want to work at, that's what they're looking for. Right? They're looking for people who can show initiative, who know how to create things, who know how to add value, and get to the end of the day and have improved the world. And you can demonstrate that in any number of ways. Like almost any passion project fulfills on those things. And you don't need much to get a lot of passion projects going. But if you walk into a job interview and you come across someone like me who's going to say, what do you do outside of work? You get to go, this is what I do outside of work. And you can, you can show them like a catalog or a portfolio or a, or a video of an event. And that person's going to go, jeez, OK. You, you can get stuff, you obviously get stuff done. And it counts way more than going, I worked for three years as a clerk at KPMG. Because <laughs> that's also not experience, because like you're licking someone's envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> I say envelopes. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for coming and please go grab another cup of coffee.